we are going to take a look at marketing Jesus again. We're going to keep going through this series. There's a reason for it. And uh, I kind of put a, a, a three-part title to what I'm walking through. So marketing Jesus in a world that doesn't know he loves them. And I think that's a big problem. The world does not know they are loved, let alone the ones who are in the church. They don't even really believe they are loved. And even worse, they don't think the world is loved. They think they're the only ones loved because they're in the in group. I hope to smash that myth to smithereens. Jesus loves the world. He loves you. He loves everybody. But the world doesn't know that. If they knew his love, their response to him would be very different than it is today. In the expanse, ever-expanding role of pastor, you meet people in all kinds of walks of life, in all kinds of situations, uh, especially with the funerals. You know, I meet unchurched families that are dealing with heavy, heavy loss at a very difficult time in life. And when we talk about the God thing, did I tell you guys this, that I offer three gods to them? Remember that? First God, heavy God, knock me over the head with a big, thick, judgmental Bible. Or no God, don't you dare even mention him. And the third God is diet God, God light. And they usually ask, what's that? Well, that's the comfort of God and the love of Christ. Well, yeah, we want that. Good, because that's all I have. <laughs> and that's what we need to tell the world. Because they have a picture of God. A picture of churchianity, and they're repulsed by it. And as they explained to me, so am I. It's so religious, it's sickening. I'd love for us to become less religious. Real with Jesus, but down with the system. Down with the patterns that we use to coax and control our spiritual highs. I used to go to a church growing up and... Uh, uh, I went there for almost like a drug fix. I got a Jesus fix. But the fix was the same. My method was go to that place, get feeling good when I leave, and by the time Wednesday comes, it wears off. So I've got to get back there for Sunday to get feeling good. My method was a place, not a person. And they can look the same, but they aren't. Big difference. Hence the series. Do we know our product? So the first two weeks we talked about the foundation. Believing like Jesus. How does he see his father? How do we see God? So the last two weeks was on who is God? Who is our product? Do we know it? Do we know it well? And we may not all see things exactly the same. It's okay. Just because you hear me teach through a lens... You may not see it exactly the same way, but I know enough of you here that there's so much freedom. And one thing we do have in common is Jesus Christ and the gospel. We're going to talk about that a bit today. Today I'm going to start talking about the motive. If our foundation is believing like Jesus, then we need to see like Jesus. And I hope to show you a lens today, give you some specs that help you see Jesus in a way you may not have expected. So that's what we want to do today. Seeing like Jesus. He saw the lost and blind and loved them. Typically, we see somebody not quite like us and we kind of walk the long way around. We know how to avoid people. Even here, I've seen it. Somebody you don't quite want to talk to and they're like in the middle aisle, like Ralph. Then you go up that aisle out of here. You know? He's really tall, so it's easy to see. You can see him coming for you to quickly deek this way. You know how to do it. You do it all in the name of Jesus. <laughs> he saw the lost and blind and loved them. So this morning, I want to begin with the fundamental basics of the gospel. Here it is. For God so loved the world. So much that He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent His Son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through Him. 
Oh. Okay, he loves us, but the message we may have heard, and who knows for what reason, they think that God's come to judge them too. He's not. He's not judging you and your behavior. He's not judging your sin. Do you know how I know this? Because Jesus became sin and died and put it away. So that is no longer an offense to him. It's done. Paid for. Finished. Put away. And he loves you. He did it because he loves you. Seeing like Jesus, how does he see? He saw the world and loved the world. The basic of who we are as Christians. 1 John 4 says, God is love. And all who live in love live in God. And God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. I had somebody ask me about uh, uh, true truth objective and felt truth subjective this week. And they had a perception that subjective was meant wrong and objective meant right. No, not at all. Objective truth, according to Scripture, is true truth. Whatever it says is clear. It's the truth. Jesus did die for the entire world. That's the truth. Do you feel like it? Well, I don't quite feel like it, Dad, because, you know, I feel kind of yucky inside sometimes when I do bad things. You know, I feel like it. That's your subjective truth. But guess what? That subjective truth will, what it says here, grows more perfect. The more you grow in His love, the more you will grow into Him and mature in Him. Becoming, listen to these words, fully formed into Christ. You're called to grow up. Stop eating pablum. Okay? We can go over the same stuff over and over, and we still have to. We do. We gotta, cannot forget the basics. I don't know why. Maybe because we're human. I don't understand. But we still have to look at the basics. The love of Christ. But we will grow in it. More perfect. So, uh, we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. The person who asked me was speaking from fear. Afraid. Most of us are afraid of something. But how many are afraid of faith? Have I got the right faith? Am I believing it correctly? Well, let me ask you this. Do you have assurance inside you that you're loved by Christ? Can you say yes? yes. That's all you need. You've arrived. What about the theology of this? I don't care about that theology. If you can't understand, you're not loved. Love is the beginning. All the other stuff can divide us. Don't let it. Love. So we're not afraid. But we can face Him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Oh my goodness, did you just see that? Because we live like Jesus here in this world. This is after He went to heaven. Okay? This is John writing this. We live like Jesus here in the world. What does that mean? We're going to cover that. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. Are you afraid of your salvation? Am I really in? Oh, what if I do that? Does that mean I'm out and i got to find my way back into salvation? Who brought you in anyway? Christ. Did He ask you to die for you? Or did He just go ahead and do it? He went ahead and did it. Because He loves you. What does that mean? You discover that. Because that's your journey. I'm sharing mine from up here. I got lucky to do that. But there's no fear in it. Perfect love expels all the fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we are not fully experienced. We, we are, have not fully experienced His perfect love. If you think God is still judging you, this is telling you you're not grown up. 1 John 2. I speak to you children because you know your sins are forgiven. That's child. 
I am really afraid that most of the religious church are clearly in diapers still. Because they don't understand the basic. They are completely and forever forgiven. They're afraid of judgment from God. If you're feeling that, that didn't come from Christ. The only thing you're going to get from Christ is His love. And if you're a believer, oh, it's going to be so cool, really wonderful and nice. If you're an unbeliever, He's not going to judge you because it's already been judged. He's not going to condemn you. He's instead going to convict you. The word means convince. That's what the word convict means. He convicts the believer of their unrighteousness and the unbeliever is going to convict them of one thing, their unbelief. That's it. That's what I said. Oh, sorry. Slip it. I'll edit that out. <laughs> he convicts the believer of their righteousness. Yes. Wow. That was a oops. See, somebody's listening. And all of you went, oh, really? Okay. I've got to change my notes now. <laughs> He's only going to be consistent with who he is, and he is love. Okay? No judgment on you. Even when you do bad things, here's what happens when you do things that do not look good on you. He's not wagging a figure at you. He instead is saying, hey, you're loved. You're righteous. You're completely clean. You're forgiven. And what that will do, it will set your eyes on Him and you'll start to see the behavior you were doing as, ooh, that is inconsistent <laughs> with who I am. That looks bad on me. I'm going to stop that. Because it does not bring glory to my daddy. The motivation is totally different. It's not guilt driven. It's love driven. It's beautiful. And here's the best line of the day. If you hear nothing else, this is it. We love each other because He loved us first. Everything we do is in response to His love. Everything. You're not created as initiators. You're created as a responder. That's it. And we see that even in marriage. Instances of male initiating to female, woman responding, all that fun stuff. There's an intimate connection there between the Heavenly Father in the same picture as you. He's the initiator. All you do is respond. You don't have to try and grovel for more of His love. You don't have to act right in order to stay in His love or get more of it. You've got it all. You need to know who you are. John 8, verse 10 and 11. A powerful story. We talked about this briefly last week. A reminder of how Jesus sees. He walks into a situation. In fact, it was brought on him pretty bad. A woman caught in adultery, brought before Jesus right from the bed, yanked and brought right to Jesus. What are you going to do with her? Religion was judging and condemning and sending messages of hate, unacceptable, unworthy, not good enough, all of it. That was religion. And Jesus does something powerful. He sees not just an embarrassed woman, he sees her heart, because Papa revealed that to him. He didn't make it up. It was because he was abiding in the Father. God was showing him. And he loved her. A woman who's about to be stoned to death. He said, I'm not condemning him. Where are your accusers? And he says, I don't accuse you either. And that's his message of love to you and I today. He's not accusing you. That's the love of Jesus Christ. Seeing. Do you accuse people? Do you judge? Do you ever misjudge Anybody here ever misjudge motives? Oh, I can't believe they did that. I'm never going to come back to that. Oh, all kinds of things. Or, I can't believe they said that. I get in trouble for that a lot. <laughs> but I trust you know my heart. A guest may not know my heart. They're uh, kind of out of the loop for now. But they will come to know my heart's good. And I don't mean intent any negative intent. 
I only mean love and good for everyone. You all know that because I've been here long enough. So you can never take first judgments and judge people's hearts and motives. It's not your job. Seeing as Jesus saw. <laughs> Let me show you something really cool. I have to give credit to where credit's due. Remember our good friend Craig Snyder? Missions Director for Grace Walk. He kind of had a chat with me about this. And so this is not a great idea that came up from me. And uh, look at how good I am. <laughs> this, is, this is Jesus loving you through Craig, through me. I hope you hear something really powerful through this text. Matthew 9, 36 to 38. Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. This is Jesus looking. You want to see how Jesus sees? That's his lens. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. I remember this being taught, and it was the club to bonk you over the head to do missions. And missions meant you have to go overseas. Okay, that, that's what I grew up with. And many of you, if you have missions backgrounds, that's the typical traditional understanding of it. I'm here to wipe that out. Save money too. <laughs> if Jesus calls you those things, that's great. That's mission. But look at where people work today. Where, where do you work again? Where? I'm asking you where you work. Uh, I was trying to remember. Oh, okay. Where? <laughs> Something eco. Uh, Enviro Stewarts. So, he has a mission there. That is his mission right now. How many of you ever go down to the corner store to pick up something? That's your mission field. How many about the post office? Anybody go to the post office? Do you know the people there yet? That's your mission field. The grocery store. Do you embark the same grocery store often? That's your mission field. We have a, a, a connection here in China. That's his mission field. Because that's where God drew him. Is it your mission field? No. You have yours. And it is exactly where you're planted. In school, at your job, in your work, wherever it is. That is your mission field. How are you seeing the people? Are you seeing them like Jesus? This is not a guilt trip. I'm hoping to draw you in. And maybe even if you have glasses on that are all crusty and dirty from not cleaning them, I want to take them off, wipe them clean, and... <gasps> Whoa! Look at those people that need loving. That's Jesus. Let's dive into this for just a minute. The gospel. Jesus came to bring us the gospel. The gospel in its simplest form is this. The death of Jesus Christ. The burial of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. Period. I had a chance to preach gospel into a dying man's ears. But I wasn't preaching. I just told him God loved him, made him right, and to believe. And if he has trouble believing, then ask Jesus to be your belief for you. And if you're even saying that, then he's become your belief already. That quick. And I saw alert eyes. I couldn't believe it. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> How am I going to know that? I'm not in his head. But I trust Jesus who loves to love those who are in whatever state of their lives, whether they're about to pass over or what. Did you know one of the jobs of angels is to usher us into the presence of God? Gee, what do they do on the way? They're ministering angels. Just to stretch your mind. I won't preach on that today. <clears throat> the gospel. Jesus literally went to the cross. He literally became sin on my behalf. 
And then He gave me His righteousness. He gave me His holiness. He gave me His right standing before Christ, before His Father. I am right before Christ right now, and so are you. Because of Jesus Christ, what He did. And if He lets you believe that, oh yeah! You get to experience something that is out of this world. It's phenomenal. The Gospel. Jesus loves the world. Even folks you don't love. Folks you can't stand, He loves them. And so, and until you can see through, let's say I'm looking at Sam, let's say he's a, an unbeliever for a minute and a repulsive one, okay? <laughs> he's not, he's an awesome kid. I look into him, and if I see repulsion and I see weird haircuts and weird hair colors, remember that? <laughs> so do we. <laughs> it's awesome. If that's all I see, I have not seen like Christ. Instead, I see a man whose soul is loved by Jesus Christ. I see someone who Jesus is passionate about, no matter what age. Until we see that, then we have no business preaching anything. Because your motive, darn it, what's your motive? If you're just trying to fill the kingdom with people who say the prayer, if that's your motive, stop. But it's gonna, it's gonna, it's doing good. Sure, it might be. But what's your motive? Do you love them, or you just want to get them to sign on the dotted line? Because then you can say, "I led this many people to Christ." How many of you? How many baptisms has your church done this year? How many salvations has your church seen? I don't fill any of that crap out. I don't. I'm not keeping a tally. Instead, I'm rejoicing at growth, 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 growth. To me, that's exciting. Not stats. It's not my church. It's not yours. But Jesus came to love. He loves the world. He loves people all around you, the ones you can't stand. He loves. He's trying to change your mind to see that. Let's take a look at this. Pitiful sight. Jesus looked and saw the people. He saw and felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. He saw the multitudes and felt compassion. Do you feel compassion? I was in Mexico, Guadalajara, over this big market called Liberty Market. And a friend of mine, Rudy, from Edmonton, looked over the crowd and said, Look at that. They're all included in the finished work of the cross. And they're loved, but they're blind and lost and don't know it. They're not Christians. Who's going to tell them? That was powerful. Seeing with compassion. It's rich. He saw them with his heart. He didn't just see through his eyes. He saw from his heart. He saw people. If you see a person on the side of the road <laughs> um, with a vehicle broken down and you know 12 kids hanging out of the, the minibus and the poor lady is trying to change the tire and screaming and you drive past and go, oh, poor dear. Hope somebody stops. <laughs> when you pull over and help. Can't always, I know that. But the compassion, the tug, the draw to people in pain. People walking through difficult waters. It gives you an opportunity to love. And for those walking through it, you become an opportunity for someone to love you. If you let them. You don't always let them, do you? Too proud. Don't give me a handout. And some are too, too bold and they say, I'll take every handout. Sure. <laughs> Hang on. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the eyes of love. Not taking, but giving. Give, give, give. Distressed. I didn't know about this. This word distressed literally means... By the way, how many of you are fishermen? Or fisherwomen? 
Fisher people. Okay, you like fishing? What? Just that's it? One? Two? Oh, good. All right, finally. All the honest ones finally go up. Now, one thing that's really yucky, um, I was fishing up at a cottage and Kevin Jenks, my brother-in-law, I decided to do the cutting up because he, he just, he was so excited about a fish. It wasn't very big, but he filleted it. He, he cut the skin away from it, cut the meat out, and what? It, wasn't, it was not a minnow. I saw that. <laughs> You go like this with minnows. <laughs> but it took the filet, the meat out, and then cooked it. And it was very delicious. The word filet is the same word that's used for distressed here. There's a, a stress issue going on. And he saw them distressed, filleted, which is an opening. I am hurting. And he saw that. A deep distress. What do you see when you see people hurting? Downcast, he saw. Dispirited. Another word is downcast. Same word that means to be thrown down like a soldier on a battlefield. Thrown down, downcast, about to die, exhausted. Can't do anything for themselves anymore. That was his lens to the people, to the crowds that he saw. And then he saw them like sheep without a shepherd. Any farmers here? Yes, Jesse and them. Do you have cows? You do, I know that. Do you have cows? Okay, do you herd your cows ever? Do you do it from the front, the middle, or the back? All three. All three. <laughs> Fine. But ask, answer me this. Do you normally drive them from behind? Yes. Not sheep. Sheep are led. And he saw them without a shepherd. He saw them not being led. Or false teachers leading them astray and causing worry and fear. And he came as a savior to them. Compassion. He had compassion on them. That word compassion has such a deep, intense feeling from the gut, almost to make you sick with deep despair. Do you ever see something wretched, painful, and, go, and just, oh, my stomach hurts from all just, just seeing that, the agony of it. This is your Jesus who loves you. He sees pain. He's engaged with your pain and with other people's pain. He's not blind. He sees with compassion. He sees the distress, the filleting of your life. You may feel like the fish being filleted right now. You may feel like that, but Jesus sees you and loves you. You're not alone. This is critical. If you're going to market Jesus, you need to see how he sees. And he sees everyone from the lens of love. Everybody. And then he says this. Then he said, by turning to his disciples, <coughs> he was looking away from the crowd, and he turns to the disciples and said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He did not say, disciples, I want you to go over to that field, till straight lines, plant stuff, water it, let the sun on it, fertilize it, do all that stuff. Did he say any of that? Does he say that anywhere in Scripture? No. Not at all. He is simply saying the harvest is plentiful. Not the almost ready to harvest. He wouldn't talk about that, would he? You ever go past an apple orchard and you see they're not quite ripe? Oh, the harvest is plentiful. No, it's not. It's not harvest. But when they're all ripe, ready to be eaten, go, oh, it looks good. He is saying the harvest is plentiful. There's lots out there. He's not asking you to go and seed. He's not asking you to go fertilize. He's saying the harvest is ready. He has done the work. I love this next line. Whew. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Who is, who is the Lord of the harvest? Yeah. Weird, eh? Tell his disciples, hey, beseech the Lord of the harvest. 
that's me. You know? <laughs> Come on, beseech me. <laughs> to see the, okay, I see the humor. Never mind. <laughs> Sent, to send out the workers into his harvest. This is not a guilt trip, but the word beseech means to beg. To beg. Why would Jesus tell his disciples to beg them? Beg him. To beg him. Yeah. He would tell them to beg him to send out workers. There's a, there's a really cool thing here. I hope you see it. This is a great picture of your true heart. When Jesus went to the cross and everyone died in him and everyone rose with him, he gave you a new heart. His heart. Therefore, it is your nature to want to do these things. You don't have to do anything. You get to now. Totally different. Beseech them, the Lord of the harvest, to send out workers into the harvest. Workers. The word here is paid agricultural worker. To send out means to grab them by the scruff and forcibly send them out. Lord, I'm going to beg you to send them out. Why? Because the harvest is ready. People are hungry to hear about the authentic Jesus, not the religious one. He doesn't even exist. But that's the one the world sees today. The real Jesus. The one who loves them. What's your motive? Do you get a check mark on? I led this person to Christ, that one to Christ, that one to Christ. Well, let me break you in on some little bit of news. You never really lead anybody to Christ. Sorry to burst your little religious bubble. Nobody leads anybody to Christ. You can't take any credit for it at all. But you weren't there. I said, I walked them through this thing. They said the prayer. I did too. You did not. Because you can't deal with a heart. God happened to put you in a place, allowed the receptivity of the person to match your willingness, and God did this thing in spite of you. You got to participate. And what you don't know is, all the 20, 30, 40, 50 other people before you that had spoken a level of love into that person's life so that they're now prepared to receive belief. You didn't lead anybody to Christ. You just happened to be there at that moment. Yeah, that's fun. Rejoice. Have a great time with it. But get off the high road bubble of, uh, I did it. Yes, see my belt? See the notches? Mm -hmm. Forget it. Jesus is in charge of his harvest. He has people ready. And if you open your eyes and see with compassion and love, you may actually then begin to hear Jesus' voice speak to you and say, that person is ready. Start loving them. What do I say? Start loving them. Just trust me. Don't even start preaching. Please. Doesn't, doesn't work very well. Just love them. And then see what your Heavenly Father does. Because many people, through loving them, their paradigms, their walls of religion, and their uh, the false concepts of God begin to fall. But it's all done through relationship. Beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers. It's not, well, I used, to, I used to teach, you do your part and God does his part. You know, or I heard it on the radio the other day, you know, do your best, God will do the rest. <laughs> How stupid is that? And good intent, but totally theologically wrong. Here's why. Jesus does it all. Through you. It's you and he together as one. Because if you say, do your part and he'll do the rest, implies there's a separation, that there's something you can do apart from Christ that has value. Ha! We've clearly learned that here at Hope Fellowship. That is not true. You can do nothing apart from Christ that will bear fruit. Start loving. See how Jesus loved. Learn. What was the compassion that drove him? It was what he saw. If you can't see, pray, God, open my eyes to see. Open them. Because somehow I'm not seeing it. Ask him. He will. He's good at that. 
And when He reveals to you, you're going to say, oh, it was there all along. Your love was there the entire time. I just couldn't see it. It's powerful. Pitiful sight. Oops. I didn't click the other two. Plentiful harvest. There are people ready to be loved. Potential harvesters. Who are they? This is not about you doing your part. Instead, this is about your union. Not onion. Union. <laughs> your oneness with Jesus. First, believe you're loved. Experience His love. Then, because He loved you first, you can love back. And that love will turn into fruit. It's all about love. You need to do nothing for God. You can say, I'm doing this for Jesus. Okay, I'm going to grill you on the for. I, is the word for Jesus mean I'm trying to do something for Him to appease Him? To get something from Him? Is that the for? Or is that just your English word for this is me and Jesus? Right? There's nothing you can do for God. He's doing it in and through you. It's powerful. I have a funny feeling. Yep. Next week. We're going to talk about the gospel. What is it? And we're going to deal more with sight. One more really, really powerful text from Acts chapter 10 for all of you who would love to have a sneak peek. Acts chapter 10 is a powerful text on how we are to see everyone. You'll love it. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, your love is enough. And I'm sorry if theology has confused folks over the years, distracted us from authentic love. It has value, but Lord, may we first love, be loved, and then love others. So our motive is not to change people, but to love them. Heavenly Father, may we as a church discover what that means. How can we have authentic relationships? Keep growing us up. Mature us to are fully formed in Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross to the grave. From the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. From the cross to the grave to the sky, what's that? The gospel. <laughs> Pretty cool, eh? Gospel means good news. And it's good news for everybody or it ain't any news for anybody. It has to be good news for everyone. So, know the gospel, share the gospel, do it with love. Thank you. You're dismissed. You came from heaven's road to show the way from the earth to the cross. The from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name.